Hey, it's Camo with the Nashville Access Show, presented by Solus North Gulch Apartments, where taste matters. Thanks for joining us today. Glad to have you along. Uh, we've got a cool guest for you. His name is Tony Ramey. This is his album, I've Always Had a Song, and he has. He's written some big hits, including hits for the King, George Strait. Come on in, Tony. Hey. How, How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had you on the show a couple of years ago now. Yeah, we were we were just talking about yeah. that walking in. It was at the meet and free. I guess yeah, it's the, gone. The old right? restaurant, yeah, that's where we started doing. This yeah. yeah, it's gone. Yeah, uh, the pie wagon. Pie wagon. That was the, yeah. I'm yeah. had lunch at the pie wagon. Yeah. So. We don't have any silverware noises and ice machine noises. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was a restaurant, so you know. Uh, it's great to have you here. You just drove down from Lexington. I did. I was up there doing the Red Barn radio show, oh, cool. which is kind of. Uh, Tyler Childers home yeah. base, you know, and those are really nice folks up there. So I was, I'm sort of on a, a radio run and then I've got a couple shows here before I head back down to Texas. Yeah, you make your home in Texas now. You have for quite some time. Right? I have about nine years. Yeah, about nine years. And uh, uh, it's, you know, it's a troubadour country down there. So a lot of, a lot of uh, venues, cafe style venues, a lot of theaters, you know, kind of my wheelhouse of theaters and some, still some uh, honky tonks and dance uh, floors out there available. So every now and then I get the band together and we're about to play some of those. And your music has always fit that niche very well. Well, you know, I guess, you know, I mean, when I moved to Nashville, I was, I always thought of myself as a little more influenced by R&B, yeah. you know, and, uh, when I moved down here, you know, doing years and years, I was here about 16 years and I was in the studio and, um, you know, Nashville musicians are the best in the world and, it, it, and sort of the, the climate sort of gets you uh, acclimated, if you will, to the country genre. So some of that was sort of bled out of me. And then when I moved back to Texas, you know, I kind of revitalized that part of, you know, where I live, you know, that uh, soul sort of Americana uh, place. Uh, and so, yeah, I've always done the country and am very influenced by country music artists, uh, Hank and Merle Haggard and all those guys. Uh, but there were a lot of those elements, I think, in those artists, you know, those, you know, I mean, Merle had horn sections. And yeah, those big well, he, hits, he came know. out of Bob Wills and the Texas whole Texas. Western swing. That's right. Yeah. Um, so he always had that. Yeah. That the old Bakersfield thing. Yeah. Ran through what he did. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, being uh, in Texas or based out of Texas now, I think musically has been sort of uh, freeing for me because I'm. You're not kind of under the publishing gun as a you know as I like to say, writing for a yeah. market and for the commercial market. I mean, I guess I still write commercial type songs, but it's a little less yeah. constrained. By and people that. always use the word commercial. I've, I've talked about this before where, you know, oh, that's commercial, almost like it's a bad thing. Well, it, it not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it can be, but I mean, commercial's root word is commerce. Yeah. Commerce has to do with money. And so, you know, art and commerce for me and a lot of other artists, friends of mine have always not easily intersected sometimes they do you know but it's not something that can be easily forced into yeah. play you know so that's why i say you know i still write sort of i guess mainstream what many would call mainstream so uh, and that is the you know sticking sort of closely to the formula yeah. that i learned here while i was here in nashville but knowing when and where to depart from it is kind of the art art part of it you know that, that some writers are when we're here, we're a little bit less likely to do that because of the market. Yeah, um, Ray Wiley Hubbard has always said. You know, oh yeah, that there you go. Difference, you know, Austin yeah. songwriting is a lifestyle, mm -hmm. and here it's a way of life. That's right. Yeah, you know, that's right. It's all about getting a cut here. And in, in Austin, well, it's like oh, staying viable. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have to when you're writing for publishers and there, you're a staff writer. You have to stay. Uh, Bible by they're, they're getting paying you to write songs. Yeah, it's getting harder and harder to recoup on, <laughs> on those 
Oh, they're making money. Money. It's it's not getting trickled down. Well, well, much. they are. You know, they're not making as much as they used to because you know the numbers don't lie. I mean, you know, uh, streaming is not uh, the most lucrative model for publishing. But you know, I guess they're making somewhere. I don't know where they're making it, but they're apparently making it somewhere. <laughs> I'm not gonna comment on that. No. <laughs> That's way out of my pay grade, right yeah, there. Right. You know. But it's been good, you know, Texas is a cool, uh, vibey music scene and lots of different kinds of music there. I mean, lots of vibrant, you know, obviously Austin's a live music capital, you know, so a lot of stuff going on, that going on down there outside of country and western and swing. And sometimes it all just gets fused together. It does. Well, I mean, that's kind of Americana, yeah. you know, I mean, that's uh, sort of my, you know, perspective on Americana is it's just sort of the, it's the umbrella term for all of that that's going on, you know, so, which is fine, you know, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Texas has, has sort of been good for me that way, and there's a lot of different kinds of music influence, you know, there. Are you writing primarily for yourself now, or are you writing for a lot of artists now? 100% myself, but I'm, other artists are recording some. I mean, I just had a couple of number ones in the Texas Regional last couple of years, and there are other artists who are recording my songs, but it's not because I'm pitching them to it's them. They're just, just, them. Yeah, they're just picking them up, or they hear one on a streaming. I don't really promote to radio, traditional celestial radio, uh, because it's not sort of in my wheelhouse, I'm sort of an under the radar type guy that plays little theaters and make it a living. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of out there grinding it out and so, uh, but I still release on all the streaming formats and all that kind of stuff, so I'm sure they probably find them there, and then I have artists to call and want to write for projects and all that, so I'm still that way. That's a, a, a much more organic way of, I hate using the word but it never is, know what it means yeah, these days. I know, but, but it, it is a much more organic way of being a songwriter. You're writing because of the song, not because you have to write the song. Well, for me, that's, you know, I, I can afford to do that more now than I could when I was writing here. That's the only oh, slight yeah. difference, yeah. you know. I mean, I'd be lying to say, oh, I was just the renegade while I was here and writing because I was writing for publishers, you know. So, I, while certainly I was in tune with making sure that I didn't compromise too much and I wanted to write what I loved, you know, there was that that cloud of, you know, <laughs> validation that constantly, you know, uh, walked out, you know, floated after you. But, but down there, it's been a little more, like I said, there's a little more freedom in the sense that, that I'm sort of in control of what I put out. And my primary goal, of course, is, you know, the people who follow me, yeah. come to my shows, that's where I try out the songs instead of playing them for a publisher or an AR person or whatever. The audience is your AR. That's right. They're they're yeah. they're kind of my record label. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. They're a lot more forgiving. They are. I mean <laughs> it's it's crazy. And they like things, you know, a lot of times that you don't expect. You yeah. know, be careful what you write. Because yeah, because you'd be singing it. Someone day. may like it. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, it, it, you just don't know. I mean, and so I have a few of those songs where I'm like, a, I'm at a show and this again. Yeah, I'm at a show and uh, like, are you gonna do? You know, I'm like, oh, I can't believe they ask for that every time. Yeah. But it, that's a good problem, I suppose, and I'm, I'm responsible for the birth of that uh, song, child. So I'm not gonna, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying. Be careful what you render. You know? I think that's another yeah. quote from Ray Wiley Hubbard because he, he had the same thing with um, Redneck Mothers. You know, that was uh -huh. a massive hit. And it's yeah. like, be sure you like that song that's, because you're going to be singing it. For the next yeah, and he is, you yeah. know. I mean, that's one of the anthems down there, yeah. you know. And so I get it. I've had people, you know, ask me to sing Redneck Mothers, you know. I've done it a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, Redneck Mothers there is kind of like... Uh, Free bird here. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is, and there are a lot of those kinds of songs yeah. and artists down there. Where before I moved there, I was like, "Who, Ray? Who?" Yeah. You know. Right. And then once you sort of become immersed in that culture of music, you know, which is 
really diverse, you start to realize, wow, man, there are a lot of iconic artists down here who are indeed iconic, who people in the other parts of the country never heard of. You know? They may have seen the name as a songwriting credit, but and, and that's, that's it. Extended. You know, I mean, I, I didn't know who Bruce Robinson was until the George Strait yeah. song, right? Yeah. And down there, he's been playing and touring for years, and you know, well, very, him and his brother, uh, yeah, that's right, that's right, and Charlie, yeah, right. And so, it's just a weird sort of wake up call to kind of get out of the bubble every now and then and kind of see what else is going on. So, it's been good for me that way, you know. I think it's been, you know, kind of eye opening as an artist and a writer, because uh, there is that fear, you know, when you leave town. Well, what are we going to do now? Yeah, what am I going to do now? Yeah, I mean, it's like, well, how am I going to actually make this, you know, into income now that we don't have the, I mean, there's kind of a comfort zone up here. You have publishers and yeah. labels. And it's all very familiar. It was, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. And so when I stepped outside of that, it's so much comfortable, but it's familiar. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right, man. I don't know if I was ever comfortable, you know, it's always the anxiety of the next cut, you know, the next record, but, um, but it was, like you said, it's very familiar and you sort of relied on the model, you know, and made a living off of it. And then when you step outside of that, you know, I was sort of like, well, now I'm going to have to make it work by myself, by myself you know, and so finding that self-sufficiency, you know, is really anxiety ridden on the one hand, but when you realize that you're able to do it, it's sort of freeing on the others. And I think that also comes with age. You care less about. Oh yeah, there's so much stuff I don't care about now. <laughs> I mean, it's really funny, you know. I, I, I mean, but you're right. The older you get, I think the less you care about little things that used to bother you, you know, more. I mean, uh, I don't know, I have, you know, I have people from the American Idol uh, show that have been on there three or four weeks calling me up and want to write songs, you know, and I'm like, eh, where do you live? You know, I'm like, oh, I'm down here, we got a studio. I'm like, eh, don't pass on that, well, you know, like, and I think about 10 or 15 years ago, I would have probably said, okay, I'll be in my car, I'll be down on a bar, you know, and, and now it's just like, the way this business is, man, I mean, you can't. You'll be gone in 15 minutes. That's exactly <laughs> what Unless you're carrying a balloon or Well, yeah, yeah, unless you, you know, you get you're struck by lightning in a couple, you know, in the same place two or three times. So I don't uh, fish, you know, I fish with the bigger lures now. And Well, it's all, you know, it seems like as a, as a writer slash artist it's the same thing as, as getting older you mature to the point where it's you're not bothered with the flash you've been there done that yeah it's, well to to a degree yeah, it, it's I mean. it's getting to the core of what you like to do and making a living of what you like to do rather than because you have to make a living right 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 and, and that's you know i think that's what i enjoy most about uh where i am now is that i sort of pick and choose the shows I want to play, if, if something doesn't feel good or feel right, I'm like, eh, I'll figure out something else, you know. <laughs> and I, I sort of roll with the flow, you know, and uh, and, and that works better for me. Uh, I mean, I think spiritually, it's I, I'm a lot better off now than I was, you know, 15 years ago when I was just hustling and trying to move and shake. I mean, there's value in that yeah. because you're growing, you're exercising muscles, you're developing, you know, becoming a, hopefully becoming a better writer, you know, and uh, you want to be, you have to find motivation, but I find motivation in different things now, you know, much more subtle, you know, things than I did uh, when I was worried about another cut or who's going to, who's cutting a new record and why didn't they cut my song and listen to that? Why did mine make it? You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just so frustrating for you when you're, you know, younger and now I'm like, you know, I don't really care if yeah. anybody else cuts <laughs> my songs or not. I mean, it's nice. nice. Don't get me wrong. No. I mean, I, I'm honored by it. I, I love it, but I don't worry over it. I, I don't sit around and look at my catalog and pitch songs and all that. And I, not because I don't 
want to cut and yeah. want people, but but just because I have more important things in my own personal. But then you get you, know, you get the big one. You know, I like get George Strait probably go, oh, we're going to cut that song. Well, you know, every now and then, because I wrote for him for a long time, yeah. uh, he'll, when he goes in for a record, I may send a few songs yeah. up there. But if you look at the number, I mean, what I don't do anymore is I don't pour through my catalog because, uh, you know, yeah. I don't know, when you get 3,500, 4,000 tunes that you've written, I mean, it takes time to yeah. sit down, I mean, literally hours try to remind yourself of all the tunes you've written and all that. So I don't spend time pouring through my catalog because I know that if, well, first of all, if George were cutting a record and looking for outside writers, yeah. okay, because Bubba's writing a lot of his songs now, Bubba and Dean, and which is great because he just, I mean, George can cut whatever he wants. He's yeah. earned that right. Yeah. And that's yeah. right. They'll, they'll, they'll buy the records and I'm glad for it. But, you know, if you look at the numbers spending that kind of time, if I were to land a song on a George Strait record, well, records don't sell anymore, it's streaming, so you do get mechanicals, but they're a fraction, yeah. you know, so it's not like... It's not like the old days of mailbox money. That's right, unless it's single, and then it goes to number one, and you start getting the PR and bonus stuff, but even that has suffered. Oh, yeah, you know, to a degree, because I still get checks from them, and it's they're not, you know. And, and those hit records, it's not like the old days where you could get a number one song and it would stay there for weeks. Right. It's usually up. It's you get one week, maybe two, and gone. Yeah, it's a blip on the yeah. radar, and then it's gone again. And if you were a air traffic controller, you'd be really nervous because you wouldn't be able to see the song. You wouldn't be able to see the plane but one second and then wonder where it is, you know. But that's the nature. The writer was that I was talking to a couple of years ago and he said, you know, he had a couple of hits with Blake Shelton, but he's also writing with others. And he said, it's almost better getting the slow burner that climbs and climbs and climbs oh, yeah. and climbs and climbs. Because if Blake releases one, it hits the charts, goes up, Boom, down. Right, right. And you don't get... Yeah, but my Doug Stone uh, hit was a slow burner. It didn't even go to number one. Yeah, but it, weeks. but Biddy, I won awards off it, but it was up there for six months, yeah. seven months, you know. And it just crawled up the charts, crawled up the charts. And that's great for mailbox money because yeah. they're still spinning the song, you know. But today, you know, that just is not... That's not how it works. And artists are what cutting a record every what two years, three years. Yeah. I mean, it's getting farther and farther. It's, it's apart. definitely becoming a much more single. It's going back to the way it was in the fifties. Right. Singles driven industry. Yeah, without the mechanical sale, you know, it's going back to that singles driven industry. So, you know, now that the Music Modernization Act is coming around, all that, hopefully they're on track to sort of re structure the payments and all that and that would be nice but we're at a point now in this in the history of music business where it's changed forever it, it, it's unfathomable that the government is telling songwriters how much they can make sure yeah it, I, it's i've never agreed with it you know it, I mean, it, my it, libertarian size side just goes berserk, you know. It's I mean, not I'm not crazy. really libertarian, but if I were, I'd really be crazy it, it, over it's that. It's not a free so. market. If you're a song, no. the government limits how much money you can make. That's right, yeah. And, and, crazy. and to me, it's, you know, it goes against the very grain of, you know, the what the economy is based on. We're you supposed know. to be a free market economy, in, in which case let the market drive what the songwriters are getting paid. Right, right, right. If songs, are, if you're not a very good songwriter, then you're not going to get paid very much. Yeah, yeah. If you're a great songwriter, you'll get paid. Right, right. And so we, and that's the other reason why, you know, I'm glad I'm not in that only, that game only, because it's such a nerve-wracking thing. I mean, every now and then I'll, I'll toss around the idea of, you know, maybe it'd be nice to have a publisher who's pitching my songs and maybe get, and, and then I'll start thinking about it. And I'm about literally three seconds in, and I go, what <laughs> am I thinking, you know? But, I mean, the ideal situation is to find somebody who just loves your music, loves your songs, and 
and his passion is willing to pay a little bit to grease the wheels enough to make it worth taking the entire copyright because that's yeah. usually what they do. But that's hardly ever the case, you know, when you're entering into a publishing deal or a record deal, especially nowadays, it's just, you know, I've heard more stories, you know, but... I mean, most record, unless you're signed to a, 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 la a big label, right? It's, la it's artist services, so you're paying yeah. the label to do everything that they... I mean, you were anyway as an artist. If you were an artist, sure. you paid yeah. for it over a long term right. as part of your contract. But, but, but at least you know, at that time, the label was taken yeah they were taking a lot of the risk bearing most of the risk and in in belief of the artist's yeah. art you know what they produce and partnering with the artist a little bit more but now that partnership has become weighted and very skewed you know yeah. uh in the traditional deals that are now typical you know coming out of not just nashville but they're everywhere you know so it's just a different time, you know, different time. And I, I, I get it, I know why they're doing it, because of the fiscal sense that it makes to do that. But on the, you know, the artist is it really served as, as well as they used to be, you know, when they go into it. It's always difficult, but now in a lot of ways, it's even more difficult. You know? I, I've seen stuff from artists and they say, I've been offered a label deal, and I look at it and say, no, you haven't. Yeah. They're asking you if you want to become their client. Right. You have to pay them. So. Yeah, bring your money and we'll make yeah. you a superstar. That's right. That hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do another song? Get your you wallet out. Yeah, get yeah. your wallet out. Yeah. And then you uh, it and stay in that position because that's how you're going to get paid. Right. Well, you know. We're watching the National Access Show with Campbell, my special guest, Tony Ramey. That guitar's here a mile or two. It has. Somebody said that to me last night on the radio show. All right, here's a little song. Uh, speaking of, it's this is more country flavor. Cool. Or you know, the um, latest album here.
Getting back into the studio, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. wait. You know, I'm real excited now. I don't want to say I'm not excited about music because I always am, but the studio work is really daunting for me because there's all of this. You know, when you're in uh, pretty much total control, yeah. that means you have more to do and more responsibilities and all that. Now, like you said, the good news is I can work at my own pace. Yeah. Um, a lot of that album is just that. I have a home studio. Yeah. So a lot of it was done at my home studio. And it's horrible to be me because <laughs> the thing is, is that I'm not a musician by trade. Right. You know, I'm not those technical, like the yeah. guys here are just geniuses. You know, they can sit down and they play. We'll, we'll make this do that. Yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> and so, but when I, so when I write, I don't think in terms of that, you know, I think in terms of how can I bang on this guitar or how can I, what riff in my head is running while I'm playing this. And so a lot of times when you get in the studio with other musicians, like real musicians, you know, they have so much more to bring to the table musicianship wise, right? And so the danger, the caution I have to take is that it's, when I go into a studio with a musician, it sounds so good when I'm there that I go, yeah, that's great. That's even, you know. And then a few weeks later, I'm like, ah, I don't know if it really needed all that, yeah. right? So uh, I have to struggle with, you know, a lot of times I've had musicians come in and play and then they play something great, and then a few weeks later, it just sort of miss, missed what I originally, the original intent, you know. So I find myself sitting down at the piano for literally 14 hours rehearsing, you know, a piano part because I just don't, the other one didn't capture it, you know, it didn't. So with this record, what I did to avoid all of that heartache, you know, is most of it I did there in my home studio. I mean, I played most of the stuff, except for a few things, you know, where I had to go outside and say, I'm just not, my limitations are, you know, I'm ending here, so I need some help with this. So I, I made a couple of trips to Nashville, some real close friends that I played with live, uh, contributed to this record. And so uh, essentially that is the product of like two and a half years of me being in the studio pounding out new songs. So on iTunes, you'll get a dollar twenty. No, now you got cents for that. If, if you're lucky, <laughs> you'll get that. But I mean, I, I think that maybe, and I don't, I'm not saying this like I'm not. I don't, I don't yeah. intend to be prophetic or no. profound about this. You know, There's but nothing this. Profound about this show, so, <laughs> well, yeah, I don't. I don't. I know it may sound this way when it comes at, uh, comes across my lips, but this may be my last album. Like, cause it's, it's reached a point of irrelevancy, it, you know. It, it and, becomes merch. It, it's well, not, it's, it's right. not a piece it's, of art anymore. It's not a, you know, I'll always do, I'll always do physical prints yeah. because I do sell those at shows, yeah. right? I'll always do that in some capacity, yeah. whether it's four song EP or whatever, you know. But I, I, 
as far as going in and saying, I'm working on a new album, yeah. right? I think that has, I have finally accepted the truth of today's, you know, yeah. world. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of really close musician friends about this saying yeah. it was so difficult for them as it was for me to come to this, to come to grips with this whole concept of, you know, and you're making an album. I had a guy, a good friend of mine tell me, who helps produce a lot of the records, a lot of this, the stuff that I do. He said, man, I do hope you know you, you're not like oblivious to the fact that you're making albums for yourself <laughs> and not for, not for everyone. And you know, it suddenly, it like a light bulb just came on in my head and I was like, you know, you're right. I mean, I'm not, because every, there are artists out there releasing singles after singles. And so I'm in there working on an album and part of me thinks, well, I'm taking two years to finish this album to release it, right? Yeah. And it's going to be cast out there with the with the other three billion singles that are, you know. And and so, it was a real hard realization for me to come to to finally go. You know, I probably need to not worry about collections or albums as much and just focus on. Music, new songs, getting those to the well, people who want them. Yeah. Four or five singles that you put out, then you put them on an EP, and, and that's that's that's, what, that's the that's the plan. It's like you know. I, I think it was a couple of years ago. I interviewed Pat Green, and right? Pat said, "I'm not doing albums." See, I'll he's EPs, just, but he's so much smarter than I am. He came to that realization <laughs> so much faster than I did. But but they they are more and more, and it just took me longer to reach that point. And so by the time I reached that point, it was November last year. That's when I had the epiphany, yeah. you know, that light bulb. By then, I was almost all all the way finished. Yeah. I had booked to master it, you know, in a few little odds and ends of time. So I went ahead and finished finished it, you know, for posterity, I guess, and put it out in January this year. But since then, man, I've come to that realization. You know? There's a, a Texas artist, Daryl Perry, yeah. many years ago. Uh, he said, when I go in, I cut enough for a full album, right? but I release it as two EPs. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not worried about radio airplay, I'm not worried about singles being out there. Right, right. It's the merch table, and I can get more for two EPs than I then can for one, one album. Then one album, yeah. yeah. That's smart, man. Daryl's a smart guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy. He's a good guy, yeah, a really good guy. And he's back in the Texas market working yeah. that thing, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you a digital or an analog guy in a digital world? Uh, yeah, sort of. You know, I'm still married to the real analog sounds you know I like when i use a keyboard or since i, was, I like running it stereo even though it's a keyboard yeah i run it and, and i like running it analog instead of midi you know yeah. now i do midi you know i still do that so i can have it but i prefer you know if i'm gonna put a piano part down i like using a real piano if i can you know and uh so I, I still I am, you know, sort of accepting that we live in that digital world, but I still strive for that realness, that live, organic, as that word, organic yeah, yeah. again, uh, feel yeah. on my records. You know, like a r real musicians are playing it, which you, they are. Have you seen uh, the Dave Grohl special on Netflix about Sound City? Is it new? Uh, a couple of years. It's, I think I might have. I've it's all about the studio like Sound City in L.A. Uh -huh. And he, he ended up, they were tearing it down, so he got all these artists in because they, they had that massive Neve board. Right. They just had that warm, incredible board. Right. And he ended up buying that board and putting it in his garage studio. Right, right. right. Um, but taking artists like Steve Nicks and, and others back there mm -hmm. to cut that. And, yeah, yeah. That well, I mean, analog thing, that, you know, you record it all analog and you mix it down digitally. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I can't afford a Neve, no. but <laughs> I, I, have, I do use Focusrite. Yeah. Those are my pre's, and that's a Rupert Neve invention yeah. that he, he built those. So, I mean, I'm very in tune with that kind of, that world, even though I'm not, I'm not an engineer by yeah. trade, but I have to stay abreast of kind of what's happening and, and what things, I, I mean, I kind of stretched the limits a little bit on this album. 
I'm working on a new EP. <laughs> I've got a new single. I've got a new single coming out in, in a you few months. Song called Glutton for Punishment. Yeah, yeah, Gl Glutton for Punishment, <laughs> right? But I'm I'm working on. I'm just finishing up the mix on a brand new single. Right? It's, it's real. It's kind of a departure from what I've been doing, but an intentional one, you know. And so uh, there's some, you know, there's some Steve Miller band synth. There's some. Uh, Straight, there are no electric guitars, acoustic. Uh, there's, you know, uh, real almost like a trap set drum kit in the back. So it's real scaled back production. It's, not, it's produced, but it's not overly produced. It's kind of an homage to the 60s and 70s sound. Uh, and so, and it's kind of, you know, it's oddly it's enough it's called the Mile Ride. So. <laughs> It, it, you know, I'm I'm excited about yeah. stuff like that. Like I've got new music come out, but but the actual process of having to go into the studio, knowing you know yeah. I've got a grueling that to me is know. the math, right? It's for me yeah. too. Yeah, and it's, when I play it's studio, the way I look at it. I loved playing, uh -huh. but I hated the math of having to be able to adjust things underneath right. and plugging stuff in and I, tuning I, and, and I all that. <laughs> It's just I put it there so I can play it. Yeah, right. And have fun it's playing it. Right, right, right. But the math that goes along with it, I don't care. Man, I tell you, I got a, I, I played a twelve string guitar for a while, you know, uh, on the road. Not recently, but when I was younger, much younger, because you know I was a huge Dan Seals fan, mm -hmm. and he, you know, sported his twelve yeah. string. And I tell you, the reason I quit doing it is you got to tune twelve <laughs> strings, man, and I got, I got to wear. By the time I was finished, I was just didn't want to play anymore. Yeah. I was exhausted, you know. Yeah. And, so I stuck and, with. I went back to six, and I haven't gone back yet. And, and then it. replacing your strings. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you got all that. Off, yeah, you, you got all that. Yeah. You know. So it was yeah, it was crazy. But I'm I'm like you. I mean, it's the whole it's the technical aspect that we shy away from mostly. But theory, you know. Growing up, I took theory, mm -hmm. and, and I hated it. That took to me. That took all the fun. It's of a lot of math. Yeah. yeah. It just yeah. took all of it was just too serious, and I yeah. thought, how can a craft that's supposed to be fun and organic be reduced to formulas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I well, I, I got a book on theory once because I <laughs> felt like I probably should, you know. And I opened it up, and I think like in the first paragraph or something, I, I read this phrase, and the phrase is like, "We're really talking about here is the relative to the relative mathematical distance between notes." And I was like, "Okay, I'm not going to read this. Yeah. You know, there's no thank you." And you so yeah, <laughs> so I closed it up. I'm like, well, that was a waste of fifteen bucks, you know. And uh, so you know, you you when you live in this town and work in this town yeah. and work around musicians, you have to eventually learn theory, but yeah. you're going to learn it by process of yeah. language. It's just a language, you know. So I think of music theory as the language of music yeah. and not so much mathematically, and that helps me but, deal with it. And, you know? But somebody explained this to me too. Math is the language it is, of it, science. That's, that's, so, that's right. I mean, you can't get away from it. Away from it. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I try to uh, convince myself. Yeah. Uh, I just have fun with the, the, the only thing mathematical I do is the hood ornament on the car. When I'm driving, it's like trying to weave it between the car and the <laughs> air. You want to do another song? Uh, yeah, yes, man. Right. I'll do another one from the from this latest album here. Which is called I've Always Had a Song. I've Always Had a Song. Now, wherever you get great music. <laughs> Where you can find music, it should be there. So I'll, I'll do the title track of this, uh, this album. And this is kind of the song that started the album, I guess. You could say when I wrote it a couple of years ago, maybe a little more than a couple of years ago. But it was, uh, I was actually, you know, what we've been talking about for the last, you know, hour, 45 minutes or whatever. Uh, Somebody asked me once a songwriter. I do sometimes I'll do songwriting clinics, you know, and I get a question. Very rarely I get questions from somebody. Like, you ever think about like doing something else, you know, or you ever think about, you know, All and the uh, yeah, yeah, and I say, oh, not not much. About I don't know, fifteen, twenty times a day, you know, that's about that's about average. You know? Yeah. So this song sort of came out of that. I think uh, uh, I had something fall through. Somebody was going to cut a song about or something. Else just kind of 
it wasn't a big deal, but it was just sort of frustrating. And I, I, I felt that frustration come on again. And, and uh, then there's a the frustration of being an artist on the road on top of that and wondering what in the world you're doing out here half the time. And so that's kind of where this came from. It's called I've Always Had a Song. Well, my daddy watched the evening news, paid off the sound of union dues, 30 hard won you. He'd tell me, son, you best hit the books. The way I see it, this whole world looks like I ain't no place to try and make a little insane. He and mama did the best, and they made the grade and passed some tests. But this old guitar came real bad. Between the dream and the fairy tales and the shooting stars and wishing wells, Still believe in that. I gave everything I had. What little I got. It's too late now to go back. So I just keep going no matter what. No oh, regrets of my. was atrocious and it's uh, national it's, it's coming it, from far people, away people from LA yeah. laugh and say you call this traffic oh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right. uh, but it's getting that way well it is man but it's growing so I guess it's a good thing so uh, I'm not going to complain about it you can come back at least you guys are here that's the good news yeah. man yeah you can come back and do this show anytime you well want. man I appreciate you thank you so much uh, thanks for having me it's and uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully the music will touch somebody somewhere. Yeah, go get it. Tony Ramey, I've always had a song, buy the whole thing or uh, buy it in bits and pieces. Either way. <laughs> Either way. Buy it or stream it like two million times. <laughs> yeah, just so, put it on repeat all yeah, the time. Keep, yeah, so. keep Tony's mailbox when he comes yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, thanks, thanks. For, thanks for being here. Really Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching the Nashville Access Show with Camo, presented by Solus North Gulf Apartments. Uh, make sure you catch me every Sunday at midday all across the UK on Chris Country Radio following Bobby Bones, and every Thursday morning at 9.30 on Tamworth Radio, 88.9 FM in Tamworth, Australia, with Joey Crosby and John Wolf. We always have a panic and do a pick of the week, and it may just be a Tony Ramey song sometimes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.